Good evening. My name is Mary Garm. On behalf of the Lackawanna County Library System, I am pleased to welcome you to the opening program of the 2009 Library Lecture Series. The series is made possible by funding from the Lackawanna County Office of Arts and Culture, and we are grateful to the Lackawanna County Commissioners and to all of you for your support. As always, we enjoy, invite you to join us in the ballroom for autographs and refreshments after the presentation. Our speaker tonight is the author of the novel selected as the 2009 read for On the Same Page in Lackawanna County, our countywide book club. Hundreds of people read Lady Killer and participated in book discussions. So in addition to those of you in the audience who are longtime fans of our speaker, and those of you who may be writers yourselves, um, you're going to, I know a lot of you are here because you were introduced to our speaker um, by reading Lady Killer. You've been talking about the book and its characters and its plot for the past month, so I'm sure we can all expect a really lively question and answer session. I'm really pleased to introduce our speaker, the New York Times best-selling author of 16 novels. Her newest book, titled Look Again, hit book stands just this week. Her novels are known for their fast-paced action and suspense, but her readers especially appreciate her humor and her down-to-earth characters. She has been honored by the Mystery Writers Association of America with the prestigious Edgar Award. In addition to writing novels, she writes a weekly column called Chick Wit for the Philadelphia Inquirer, and she teaches a class in justice and fish fiction at her alma mater, the University of Pennsylvania Law School. Yes, she's also a lawyer. She hails from the Philadelphia area. She is the proud mother of her daughter, Francesca, a graduate of Harvard who is currently living in New York City. She shares her home with four dogs and two cats and her backyard with horses and chickens. Get ready for a delightful evening. Please join me in welcoming Lisa Scottolini. <laughs> God, thank you so much, Mary. I wanted to take a second to thank uh, Mary Garm and Mary Barna and all the people who worked so hard to put this I can't see you, this is sad. All the people who worked so hard to put this together, I am hugely honored. Um, you know this reception before we had, and I look out of this incredible building and in this incredible room, and I feel like somebody is going to wake me up very soon because this is an author's dream, you know, to be read, to have all these people energized, to talk about books, and I want to hear your questions later. But uh, I am so grateful to each and every one of you. I know you have lots of things to do at night, and it's so nice that you came tonight. So thanks to all of you for being here. I want to say a special thanks to the librarians in the group and to the teachers in the group. First teachers, as Mary mentioned, I have recently begun teaching, I guess, the past three years at uh, Penn Law School, and I, can't, I have a lot of energy, usually. I cannot believe how tired I am at the end of the day <laughs> when I teach. Teachers are, you know, I really like to write about the unsung people, strong women, and we'll talk more about that, but I really feel like teachers and librarians epitomize that. So to the teachers who are here tonight, can we applaud for them? And also librarians. I mean, it's so, libraries are a cause so dear to my heart, and I know you all support the library here. I know Mary has, you know, Mary is much too modest a person, but she, she I, I will tell you, uh, and she'll cringe, how much work she has done for Pennsylvania libraries statewide, all the lobbying she does, all the endless work, and uh, this, for this community, I know you know her, and you know you've had the benefit of her hard work, and Mary Barnes and all the other librarians here. I, I love to speak about librarians because I would not be an author but for librarians. I grew up in a really close-knit Italian-American household. We had hugs, we had meatballs, we had one book in our house. <laughs> what was the book? The Bible. The Bible. Aren't you so sweet? 
I must be in Scranton because, no, the book was TV Guide. This is me, and I'm going to tell you the truth. They didn't read a single book. There was not a single book in the house. It wasn't until I went to school, and God bless school librarians too, because I just loved to read, and I caught that bug that sometimes little girls get where I couldn't, I just couldn't get, and I couldn't believe that when you went to the library, they only let you take 12 books out. So mean. And the school librarian said to my father, God bless him, you know, your kid likes to read. And he's like, why? But you should take her to a library. And she, she gave him a list of libraries, and the sweetest guy in the world took me to the library. Of course, he sat outside in the car because there was no TV in the library then. And he was like a little doggy out there waiting while I wandered and wandered. And I, uh, I remember, you know, I'm, I'm 53, which means that I cannot remember where my car keys are. <laughs> but I will tell you, I remember my first library card. It was orange. I grew up in the suburbs outside of Philly. Ballot had a little steel plate on it, right? Anybody have that kind? And when you uh, took the cards out, they ran it like a Visa card, something we do it under, right? Pachook, right? And my number was 3925. I remember because I would take it home and press it on my thumb. And I thought about it more recently, and I thought, why is it that I remember that number when I don't know what date it is? And the reason is because emotion is connected with that memory. And then you say, well, why is emotion connected with that memory? Why does a library card mean so much to a kid? And I thought about that. Because I think, in truth, it's the first piece of real grown-up identification you get. Remember when you were little and your, and your parents had all those plastic things? And, well, they had credit cards. And they got mail. Do you remember when you wanted bills? <laughs> I was like, wow, look at all that mail. That's what grown-ups do. Well, the library card, I think, is the first piece of ID that kids get. For me, it said, you read, therefore you matter. And my parents, God bless them, loved me to death, but it really wasn't a message I got at home. And it was a message that librarians and libraries in our beloved state nurtured in me and for me. And so I get to stand before you today and you get to have a book that has my name on it. None of the thanks is to me. It's really to libraries, so let's hear it for them, too. Well, I thought what we'd do tonight, first we're gonna have fun. I thought I would tell you a little about myself, then I'd tell you more about myself, and then I'd keep talking about myself, and soon you would understand why I'm divorced twice. <laughs> but basically, I thought I would tell you a little bit about how I came to be a writer, what I think I'm writing about, where I get my ideas, and then open it up to questions. I must tell you, since I was a bookaholic, I just love to read. And I always dreamed of writing books, but I didn't really think it was gonna be a stable profession. And so I went to law school because I liked Perry Mason and had a crush on Raymond Burr. <laughs> and then of course he turned out to be gay, like a lot of people I get a crush on, it's really unfortunate. In any event, I, I loved being a lawyer, but to tell you the truth right up, I was happily married, and about the time my daughter was born, my marriage sort of fell apart. This isn't very literary, I know. Stay with me. We're in Oprah territory right now. But I basically had a daughter, and it changed everything about me. Because as much as I loved being a lawyer and the excitement of it, and Oh, the big deal of it, and you wear your contacts, and maybe whatever you do, you're in the world. Here's this little pink baby with these gorgeous blue eyes. I'm, I'm, I, I fell in love. And then I thought, I thought I would go back to work in three months. Now, this was in the 80s. Does anybody remember the 80s? <laughs> Please, God, tell me. It was a very go-go era. It was all about working, and greed is good. And women, professionals who were having babies, whatever, you had a baby on the job. I worked for a law firm that had a breast, an electric breast pump <laughs> for women, like not for cows. I'm like, something's really wrong here. In any event, when you had a baby then, you would be like, you weren't allowed to stop. You weren't allowed to break stride. You had, you're sort of running, oh, you know, something fell out and it was, 
your firstborn. You, you were not allowed. It was dress for success. Do you remember dress for success? Women wearing ties. Great idea. And basically, I said, I want to stay home and raise this child. And it's a very personal decision. I Really, you can't make it right or wrong. But I knew for me it was right. Now, I had no alimony. So in short, I had to figure out another way to make a living. I was completely broke. But at that point, I said, you know what? You can't get any broker than broke. It turns out you can. <laughs> and basically, I said, I want to stay home and raise this kid. And I always wanted to write a book, and I actually believe that everybody has a book in them. So why don't you try to write it? You were an English major. You went to Penn. Go. And also around that time, um, there's a, I, I always read thrillers. And there was a guy named John Grisham, who you know. He's not from Pennsylvania. <laughs> His loss. And basically, there were lots of, you know, if you read a lot of thrillers at the time, or even a lot of novels that were popular fiction, I'm just going to tell you straight out, the women weren't the lead. I, I was seeing a lot of really great men characters, and we were the wives and the girlfriends, which I guess is fun, although it's been a long time since I've been either of those. But I thought, why are the women not the main characters? Because what I've seen in my life, and maybe because I grew up with the most incredible mom, that I wasn't seeing in popular fiction what I was seeing in my life, strong, women, fun women, independent women. We run households. We, let's start with that we give birth. Let's hear it for that, man. When I had that child, I looked at all of us differently. I thought we are the, we're the, we're the most unwhiniest people ever, because no one would even believe what happens in that labor and delivery room. And I thought, why I want to write books where I'm seeing women in the lead, and especially because I just have a little girl, and I'm not sure what to give her to read because I grew up on Nancy Drew. And frankly, there wasn't a lot else for her. So I said, you know what, start writing. Long story short, five years of writing and writing and writing and rejection. My favorite rejection letter was from a New York agent who said, uh, we don't have time to take any more clients, and if we did, we wouldn't take you. <laughs> Thank you, New York. And every time I see that guy every year, and I want to take my book, and I throw it right in his face. It's like 17 years later, I'm not over it. Um, but I really felt like I had to really just give it a try. And so I did. And I lived, if you're wondering, I lived on credit cards. I mean, this is me being straight with you. Uh, it, it's not a sob story. It was actually really great. I mean, unfortunately, we. You know, it happens that we get a little excited and live beyond our means, and I certainly did. I paid all this debt back, but I got to 38 grand in debt at 21% on my five cards that I, I know, incredible, I know. That's the bad part. But the good part is that, just to tell you a brief story, um, it's my daughter and I, right? I'm trying to get her through to get to kindergarten. I'm writing at night. I'm writing when she takes a nap. She doesn't nap half enough, and basically, she has almost everything she needs, which is books, DVDs of The Little Mermaid, we watch endlessly. And also, we would go to dinner sometime at Chili's because they took credit card. Now, what happened is, by the way, um, since I had no cash, I couldn't go anywhere there was cash. And those were the days when McDonald's only took cash. So by the time she was six, my daughter was the only child in America not in McDonald's. And of course, that meant it's the only place she wanted to go. So finally, to fast forward, I actually sell a book. And it's not really a living wage. But basically, I have to pay back all the debt. And that means we're eating McDonald's and not Chili's. <laughs> but I have to teach my daughter the way of McDonald's. So I take her into our local McDonald's, which is in Paoli. It's a fancy one. You get your roots done when you go to Paoli. And um, <laughs> I say to her, listen, uh, these are the lines. And that's the menu up there. And she looked at it, because she remembers chili. And really loudly, she said, but where are the appetizers? <laughs> oh, yes, that happened. Every head turns. Who's this little brat? You know, I, I, I want to say, she's broke. She just doesn't know it. <laughs> Which is as it should be, right? That's why we're the parents. But to make a long story short, after when she got to be six, I got her to six. I had nothing published. I was in despair, but I said, well, then I'll just go back to work and I'll take any job I can get because I'm still, a, I'm still in the line for her. And I really felt like, besides the fact that I loved being home with her, 
I felt like I wanted to write, and I also felt to a certain extent that she was getting a little bit of a raw deal. So long story short, like for example, she goes to circle time in kindergarten. She comes home one day and she said, Mom, do you know that there are people in the houses and they live with the mom and the dad in the same house? <laughs> That's disgusting. I in any event, I take a job as a law clerk. One week into that job, my first book sells to HarperCollins, which is in Scranton. That's why I come to Scranton all the time. Let's hear it. <laughs> Publisher that gave me my first chance. Thank you very much. And I was there 15 years at HarperCollins. Um, still kept the day job till the second book, which won in Edgar. And happily, then I had a job where I could almost pay back the money. It took me the next five years but work full time, and so I got to raise my kid who's now 23. God bless America, right? <laughs> what do I write about? Well, you've read me, I'll tell you a couple stories. You'll, you'll recognize them. The truth is, you know, Mary Barna said a nice thing. She said, you know, I don't, don't always read books that look like legal thrillers, and I thought, you know what? I'm not writing that, and she said, no, you're not. And in the beginning, because there were lawyers in the books, and they said, well, I was the female John Grisham. And I said, well, uh, I feel like I'm cross-dressing if you call me that. I, I'm not that. I, I actually think I'm writing stories about women. And my motto, my little touchstone, I have this quote above my desk and also in my jewelry box is this. It's a quote from Eleanor Roosevelt. And it's, a woman is like a tea bag. You never know how strong she is until she's in hot water. <laughs> how great is that? That's what I say to myself. And it's even good for your personal life. I mean, it's good for now. You know, we're terribly stressful times. You go, it's just hot water. It's going to cool down, and we're going to have a very strong cup of tea. But we're going to get through it. And I wanted to really, and that's, so that's what I started writing. And the part of the stories come from memory. You know, where do you get your ideas? One is I'm walking down the street one day. I'm walking with my mother. We see a car pull up at the curb. It's pink. This is a long time ago. I was about eight is what we figure. Fins, chrome, woman at the wheel, piles of black hair, dark, dark eyebrows. My mother starts to laugh. She says, watch this. She walks over to the car, which is stopped at the light. The woman driver with the dark hair turns around, cranks the window up in my mother's face. My mother starts to laugh and walks back to the car. I said, who was that? She said, that was my sister. <laughs> oh, I'm telling you the truth. I'm like, what? That was your Aunt Lena. We haven't spoken 17 and a half years. <laughs> and meanwhile, then I, so I grow up, right? Now I'm in my family where tomato sauce and thick, and blood, they're very thick. That, we, that I don't know my Aunt Lena is remarkable to me. So I interview all my family. I said, why don't we speak to Aunt Lena? Half the people think she brought a gun to a wedding. You thought I was classy, didn't you? You, were, you probably didn't, actually. And half thought she brought a gun to a Holy Communion. <laughs> they sold this as a difference. By the end, I was actually convinced there was, because it would be the liquor at the wedding, or a cash bar in my family. And, uh, <laughs> and at the Holy Communion, the liquor wouldn't be out till what, 3.30, 4. <laughs> what I listened to and I learned from my family, though, was that these were people who had a set of rules, which is just what law is, after all. They're notoriously historically rebellious sort. They don't like authority, so they make their own rules. And under the rules of the Scottolinis, if you did something so antisocial as to bring a loaded weapon, which she got for all I know she may have, to a place where there's going to be hard liquor, we will exact upon you our version of capital punishment, right? You're dead to us. <laughs> Aunt Lena was dead to us. And I said, that's a novel. And those of you, I, where's my girl who said Vendetta Defense was her favorite book? That's Vendetta Defense. It's a story of a family feud. I don't think Italians have the markets cornered on it. <laughs> but I love to write about that stuff. It's a story where a, a young woman lawyer is going to defend an Italian immigrant who killed somebody as a result of a vendetta. The United States says it's murder, and Pennsylvania law says it's murder. She's got to prove him innocent. Is he? I don't know. Another story comes out of a weirder circumstance that happened to me, which was that I found the one day there's a knock at the door. I go to the door. Long story short, there's a woman at the door who looks exactly like me and says, hi, I'm your half-sister and I really like your books. <laughs> now, let me tell you, 
I want to get new readers. <laughs> but I much prefer to get them this way. And so here she comes in, and I'm looking at her, and it turns out that she, is this too personal to get? This? Am I like, should we get somebody literary in to talk? Plot and character, I can talk about that if you want to talk about that. All right, okay. So anyway, what she says is, I'm lowering my voice, there's like videotape. <laughs> Come closer. What she says is that my father, God bless him, had an affair. Oh, uh, yeah, I know. And, um, Child was put up for adoption. Before you feel bad for her, she was put up for adoption with a wonderful family, had a wonderful adoptive parents, two professors, right? I got the crazy family, <laughs> okay? <laughs> but she looks completely like me. We're very close in age. And I said, this is very interesting because there is a God and he always sends you the tests that you should have in your life, right? Excluding my second husband, which we won't go into. But so here I'm looking at, here I am, I believe in family, I believe in blood, I was raised to believe that, but I happen to be looking into the face of a family member who is a stranger. And I said, that's a novel. Let's give that task to somebody who can handle it, namely Benny Rosado. Right? So in Mistaken Identity, she looks across at this woman who's her twin, and the twin says, defend me on a murder charge. And Benny is off and running. What I do is just, I had that emotional experience that year. And so I just sort of take notes on how I felt because the real feeling I had was how it feels to be found when you didn't know you were lost. That was what it was like. So I gave those feelings to Benny. And that's what's underneath the book. You know, I always want the books to have an emotional wallop. Dead Ringer was just sort of what if what if, what if my evil twin, now first off, my half-sister is a great person. She's lovely. Her name is Jean, and my brother and I like to call her Jean Poole. <laughs> I wish I thought of that, my, bro my brother did, which is really sad. Um, she doesn't think that's funny, but I think it's funny. And of course, like, she's super nice. And it's like a bad Patty Duke episode, really. Please tell me you remember who, but... You know you could, you could sing that theme song right now, couldn't you? <laughs> Later, we will. We'll drink and we'll sing. Um, but basically, you know, she's, she's been married to the same guy. She has a great successful marriage. He's such a great guy that he built their house. <laughs> what? You know, and she's an organic gardener. You know, I mean, she just is really like a, we couldn't be more different, you know, and then, and, and, but, but, when I meet her and see her and talk to her, it's like talking to myself. But I said to her, so Jeannie, what if instead of having a great childhood, you had a horrible childhood? You were raised by some horror show family and then you found out, because that's how she found out, she looked in the birth certificate, it says Scottolini, she said, I know those books. And she found us. God bless her, I honor that. That's a scary thing to do. But if you're on the receiving end, it's weird. But I said, let's think about it if your life had sucked. That's a literary term in case you have any questions. <laughs> You can ask a librarian and they'll explain. And, uh, but then you came to see me and it looked like my life was like cool, which is important that you appear to be cool when you're not, which is about all I can manage. So I said, how would you feel, Jeannie, if that happened to you? And she said, I'd be so happy that your life was so great. And I was like, okay, well, you're no help because clearly I'm the evil twin. And that's what Dead Ringer's about. The evil twin comes back because everything that her, the good twin has, she is burning with resentment about because it was, she feels that it was at her expense. And I can go there, I have a dark side, I can be jealous, I can be ugh, gah, 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 all that stuff. And so I just want to imagine that and explore what happens in that battle of good and evil. And you read Lady Killer. And Lady Killer is, a book, is the first book I wrote after Killer Smile. Now, I've written about this denunzios. I started with Mary Denunzio. And I must tell you that as much as I think about fiction, and really, I don't mean to joke around. We will talk about serious parts about books and fiction. I'm happy to do it. But I had not realized how much of the denunzio family is my own family until my dad passed, really. And I was very close to him. And when he passed, I found that I could not write Mr. Denunzio anymore. And they don't even look alike. I mean, they don't. They're not, but the soul is the same. 
which is the great thing about fiction. I want to come back to that at the end. So I took a couple of years off, not of work, because I have a mortgage. But I basically started to write what we call standalones, different kinds of stories. And um, the new ones are standalone, I'll tell you about that in a minute. But Lady Killer was the first book I wrote after five years when I felt that I could deal again. And in a way, it was a way of keeping my family, my father, with me. There's a lot, you know, and I want you to hear your questions about Lady Killer, but really it's always about the same thing, right? Mary Denunzio is a strong woman. She just doesn't know it. And I think that's like a lot of us. It's a lot like me. You know, I, I mean, it's hard to always remember. Sometimes I think I write these books for myself. It's hard to always remember that whatever the scary thing is, you can do it. Can you figure out how to manage your own money? Can you clean your own gutters? Can you talk to the car mechanic? My car broke down on Monday, and I'm saying, he's telling me the oil's going back in the control system. And I said, Lisa, you have to understand this, because you don't have anybody to tell, you know, you gotta figure this out. You can figure this out. He's not that smart. <laughs> and so that kind of, the Mary's a lot like that. Um, I think if you were gonna say which character is most like me, it's probably Mary. Uh, although she's a better Catholic. <laughs> you know, I've a little lapsed. Once, I, when my, we were little, I told my daughter we were lapsed Catholics, and she said, she heard that we're collapsed Catholics, <laughs> which, which might be closer to the truth. But, but Lady Killer, too, is about a woman who's really confronting herself, her past. You don't know it at the outside, at the outset, because I also like to look, to, now look, I had a great time at that reception. I found, I was in book club heaven, right? You all are enormously good to each other. And I love that. I love girlfriends. I always have girlfriends in the book. But this is a story where she has a really good girlfriend in Judy, a girlfriend who's so good that she'll hate somebody on her say so. That's the kind of girlfriend you want, <laughs> right? The one who will, who, if you murder somebody, will bring the hefty bag and the shovel. <laughs> no questions. No questions. My best friend said to me, if you ever kill somebody, I knew you had a good reason. See, that's, that's friendship among women. But right, Trish is a nemesis. Trish is the one that we knew in high school. I knew in high school, because I was Marion, not Trish. And so Trish comes into her office and says, help me, and the tables are really turned. And in a way, Mary has come far from the neighborhood, which is good and bad. Right? Those great ties that she has, to a certain extent, bind her and hold her back. And when she says yes to Trish, because choice is always the best source of drama, you know, when I think about what makes something dramatic, it isn't a bad thing happened, a bad thing happened, a bad thing happened. That's Job. It's really a choice. Think about that next time you pick up a book. Any book, you'll start to find a fulcrum of choice. Sophie's Choice is named Sophie's Choice because at its core, she has a choice to make. My new book has a choice to make. This one, she makes a choice first. The choice is, am I gonna represent her? Tells you something about Mary that she says yes. That she's good-hearted enough not to let her drown, although she'd love to, because he tormented her her whole life. And not to go into, because you read it, but the bottom line is that what Mary is gonna do is go on this search, and in the end, she's gonna find out more about herself. It ends up being a book about mother love, doesn't it? Sort of a dark mother love. And I think it's because I'm always thinking about mother love and that's what Look Again's about. Look Again was a book that came out of this idea. I was driving home with my daughter about two years ago from school. Now she went to school in Boston, I would drive her home from Philly. Now, anybody have college age kids and can't stand packing them, their crap in the car? Please, show of hands. My God, talk about unsung. Every time we do that, because she saves everything. She's got shoes, she's got a poster that can't be beat up. I, you know, I only got the, the car. We're driving home from Boston to Philadelphia. We've packed in, school year's over. Packed the whole car full, have a box spring on the top, and a mattress, and a red rug, which as it turns out, bleeds, because it starts to rain. I have a white car. By the time we're on 95, right, people are looking and pointing, and we finally get out in Connecticut, and the car looks like the blood mobile. 
I mean, and we just got back in the car. And we laughed, and if I tell you that we laughed almost all the way home, people are looking. And, and, the, and what happened is I said to myself, hold this moment in your head. You who can't remember anything, remember this moment. Because you're not going to have a lot of these now. She's getting big. She's a year from graduating. You're going to have to let her go. And I hate letting her go. You know the joke about what's the difference between an Italian mother and a Rottweiler? Eventually, the Rottweiler lets go. <laughs> Absolutely true. And Italians don't have the market cornered on that either. Good mothers don't want to let go. We love them. We know how scary it is out there. And that's what gave me the idea for Look Again. Here's what happens. Woman comes home. She's got all her, her mail in her hand. On the top is one of those, have you seen this child flyers? Do you get those? I get this. Oh, and by the way, the woman's a single mother, a fake blonde, <laughs> lives outside of Philadelphia, and writes for a newspaper. <laughs> I know, soon I'll write fiction. I feel sure of it. And basically, she looks at the card, and the picture in the middle looks exactly like her adopted son, Will. And she, well, the first thing she does is go into shock. because She's like, this can't be my child, because my child isn't missing, and I lawfully adopted him. And basically, she goes into a sort of denial, which I'm an expert in. I didn't have to do the research for that. <laughs> and so she looks away. She tries to throw it away, actually, but she looks again, which is where I got the title. And she has to face a very difficult choice. If my son, if this is really my son, then he rightfully belongs to somebody else. If my son rightfully belongs to another family, do I keep him or do I give him up? Because you guys are smart. Readers are smart. And then you know the first page, that's going to be the question. And that's going to be the question that's going to carry you through those pages. And I, I always like to have issues of justice and injustice in the book, of right and wrong, of a moral dilemma, of an ethical dilemma. You saw them in Lady Killer. And, th and that book really puts it squarely. I think it's something that you differ on. I think it's something that book clubs would love. Um, you know, I really like to do a book, because when I finish this book, I don't show anybody while I write, and I don't write with an outline, so I don't really know what's going to happen. You know, people say, do you know the end? I don't know the middle. <laughs> but I think that's not a bad way to write a thriller or something that moves fast, which is what I'm trying to do, because you want to always say, what would logically happen next? And if, if character is best revealed through action, and I think it is, right? You don't say, she's brave. You show her brave, being brave. And character actually is the same as plot. So for a minute, think about this example, and then I'll shut up. Am I OK on time? Imagine right now something horrible. Imagine right now that somebody bursts in those back doors with an AK-47 rifle. Boom, 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 starts firing. All of us would react, and we would react in character by definition. I suggest to you, you don't always know, right? Because isn't part of life that you don't know how you're going to react till you're there? Right? I thought my father was in remission. They told us he was in remission, and then he wasn't. They're like, this can't be. How will, what will happen to me? You sort of see. We all get those trials and tests. And so what you want to do in a novel is you show everybody react in character, and that defines those people. The brave people run to the front. The super smart people call 911. Me, I'm probably going behind the podium. Right? Everybody is reacting in character. And by the way, whatever they do is what drives the next chapter. The person who runs to the front, something's going to happen, and that's what happens next. If you write a book, at least it's the only way I write it. I mean, you know I'm not that organized. I basically told you I got divorced about the same time my baby was born. That's not a good planner. <laughs> I'm not good at planning. So basically, I try to go, what would logically happen next? And what I hope I get from that even though it's the only way I could write a book. But what I hope I gain is a narrative flow that is logical, that is consistent with character, that reveals character, and so that we're all along the same journey and also feels fresh. That you don't have that kind of mad libs feeling. Because I think that's what, if I did an outline, I would be feeling like I'd be writing mad libs. Oh, this is the part where this is supposed to happen? 
can we get somebody to write this book? Because that's no fun. And if I'm alive when I write it, then I hope the liveliness comes off the page. And I hope that it works for the kind of stuff I'm trying to write, which is a fast-paced story about these women who are just like us, who are strong like us, who are weak like us, who, who do amazing things that don't always get in the movies or in books. That's what I want to write about. Mary D'Annunzio, Betty Rosado, and the new one, Ellen Gleason, and see how they deal with the troubles that life throws at them, because God knows you never know where your life leads you. And if you write a, a novel like Lady Killer is very much in Mary's head, right? There's no omniscient point of view. So to take a second to, to talk a little English major talk for you, um, you can only know what goes on in Mary's head. It's actually not a classic way to write a suspense novel. It's a dumb way to write a suspense novel. If you want to write a suspense novel, you go in an omniscient point of view. So if we go back to our theory of the guy pulling up, this is how I'd write it. Out front, there's a guy looking for a space. He parks illegally. Let's come back. Next scene. Here we are in here, talking, laughing. Ooh, that was good carrot sticks. You're on a diet. The carrot sticks are great. <laughs> they actually were. Next scene, back to the guy. He's parked his car illegally. He's got the gym bag out of his trunk. It's an unusually long gym bag. There's some kind of something sticking through the front. What is it? Now, right? Smart readers are already going to be worried because they're going, why are you telling me about this guy? Something bad's going to happen. Come back to here. We're oblivious, right? Because we can't know what's going on out there. But you already, if you're the author, have your easy your reader worried because the reader knows the guy's going to come in and start shooting. That's why most suspense novels are written that way. The next one you pick up, check it and see, now you know why. But I don't always like to do that. Sometimes, because I like people, I think the most important thing is character. I want the path that she undergoes because I want to show you how strong she is because I want to see her get strong. So I want to tell it in her point of view only. And when you do that, you get a twist. That's how you get a plot twist. And that's like real life, right? Because one day Mary D'Annunzio is minding her own business and in walks her old boyfriend. Well, in walks her nemesis of her old boyfriend, the girlfriend, and she's going, oh my God, what happens now? And a body turns up and it's not the one she thinks. What happens now? What is she gonna do? She's gotta decide. So that's at the heart of Lady Killer. And look again, it's the same way. You get that flyer and you wish you didn't get it. Isn't there stuff you wish you didn't know of? I wish I didn't know that, but now that I know it, I can't ignore it, I can't pretend it doesn't exist, and I guess I have to deal with it. And she's a journalist, and she believes in truth. I think a lot of us do, too. I don't. The occupation helps flesh her out. I also wanted to write somebody under all kinds of pressure, because I don't know what your life is like, but mine seems to be when it rains, it pours, right? Like, when something goes wrong, everything goes wrong. And thank you, we get through it. So that's sort of where I come. That's where I come from. That's where I come to. What I try to do is write about us in a way that I hope is entertaining, in a way that I hope tells a story. I hope you see yourself in these books. I, I think you will. You know, they're not experts. They're not like Superman books. They're not 007 or Robert Ludlum or Jason Bourne. I love those books too, but that's not me. I'm the one who's driving around trying to look for Vine in Washington, <laughs> right? I actually, you, there is probably somebody here who caught me because I thought it, I didn't realize it was a two-way street. So I was actually on this side of the street. And you're all so lovely here that she was like, hi. And I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> We're about to have a head-on collision. So I hope you see yourself in them because ultimately to me, and that's why the great gift goes to librarians and teachers and all the people who make us appreciate books. Because when I think about why fiction matters, it's because it's in the made up stories that you find the truth. And when I think about why books matter, is because it connects us. You know, I, you always have a thing you want kids to read because I think it's so important for success it's so important, for, and they, so the, the slogan we've come up with is reading is fundamental, and I wish I could think of something different. Because reading to me nourishes, reading enriches, reading connects. That's why book clubs matter. That's why book clubs work. 
you get together and for three minutes you're talking about the book and the next hour are about right your husband's your job <laughs> or this or that right because fiction connects people that is glorious and towards that end, let me mention something, because I was so happy to be read by book clubs. I know that sometimes book clubs like to read stuff that looks more literary. Can I just say in my own defense, you know, I'm not as low rent as they think. <laughs> Despite the gun in the wedding, don't tell them that part. Um, I try to write issues in. I, I want characters to deal with the hard questions. Good and evil are the big themes, justice and injustice, love and hate. And I love to be read by book clubs. And so what I've started to do, and I want to pitch this to you so you know, is I have a book club party. I've had it for the past three years. If you read the next book, and you hold it up, and you send a picture to me, you are automatically invited to a huge party at my house. <laughs> I live in Malvern. You're welcome. And I get a tent, and there's food. The first year I tried to cook. Now I don't. But lots of people come in from all over, Mechanicsburg, Centralia, lots of Wilkes-Barre, lots of people come in. And you are welcome to it. So check out the website for it. I would love to see many of you again. I would love to, I mean, I know it's a trek, but you might like it. And what's so cool about it is it's sort of a mass thing. And what happened this year was, you know, we have a tent in the backyard, and everybody for the first five minutes start talking about, well, my books, and then goes to, you know, when you make those lists, what you're going to read, other people's books, and in the end goes instantly to husbands and dogs and kids. And God, it's so much fun, and of course there's chocolate. So now you know all the stuff that's behind the scenes. That's really what I'm trying to do, bring us closer together. Above all, I feel close to you and thankful to you because you read me, which is why I started grabbing you and hugging you downstairs. <laughs> I hope you don't mind. But thank you for this. This tonight was really a dream come true to see this great group in this glorious place. So thank you to Mary and Mary and all of you. So thank you. Now, do we have time? Do we have time for questions or did I go on and on endlessly? Please. Oh, I can't even see anything. So I, I see something vaguely. Can you see to call on someone? What microphone? Oh, everybody do, do what they say. Are you someone at a microphone? We have two microphones here. If you come to one of them, I will answer anything. Question. Anything about the column, anything about books, anything about other people's books, anything about anything. I'm not shy. Wow. Yes. Uh, I'm, from, I'm from Philadelphia. Oh. Yeah. I forget you. Uh, <laughs> I've, I've noticed, I've noticed uh, the writers today, they're more women than men. Seems like there's a big growth. Uh, there's more women than men? Yeah, oh. much, much more. Uh, what do you attribute that for? Well, you know, I gotta tell you something. I'm not sure that's true. Oh, yeah, <laughs> I don't know. I'll tell you a story. I'm talking about current writers. You're talking about what? Current writers. Well, I can't, we have no way to. Yeah, I, I don't think it's true. It but is. Me, I don't think it is. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> no, I'm sure. It may be. I don't really know, but I'll tell you something interesting. I think a lot about if it makes a difference. I was in a, I'm on book tour now. And so this didn't happen this year, but it happened to me in the past. I was in an airport and I'm watching somebody, because my books are in the airport bookstore, right? And I'm watching the guy, oh, I wish I had, I need to hold something. Give me it. Thank you. I, for some reason, I need a prop. God picks the book off the shelf, looks at the, reads the flap, looks at the back, looks nothing like me. Now you know. I make them Photoshop. Oh, yeah. Costs a couple grand. It's just a big singles ad, really. Um, basically, he looks at the book for 20 minutes, and he sets it back down. <laughs> no. <laughs> what do I do? Being from Philadelphia? I buy the book and I give it to him. <laughs> I get to him, I say, sir, you made a mistake. Would you like this book? I'm the author, although I look nothing like her. And uh, he said, really? I said, yeah, I'll sign it for you. So look, geez, thank you. 
I said, but do me a favor, I'm curious, why did you put it back because you spent so very long with it? And he said, I put it back because I don't read books by women. Thank you for that loyalty. I said, well, you know, give me a chance. And he wrote me back three days later and he said, I really loved your book, you write like a man. So what I'm saying to you is, I don't know if there's more women than men, I perceive there's more men than women. Uh, and the truth is, I'm on a lifelong quest to figure out if we write different stuff and how we're different. But I can't explain how women are different from men because I'm divorced twice for a reason. <laughs> Does that answer your question? Well, uh, no. <laughs> I think you're wrong. But, but did you ever write under another name? No. Like Nora Roberts? No. no. If you have a name like Scottolini, how could you ever give somebody? My father said, tell them it rhymes with fettuccine. Are no. you from South Philly? My mom was originally. Yeah. Said, what did you say? <laughs> the natives are getting restless. Well, you're right. <laughs> Thank you, though. Thank you. Yes. Anything. Did someone? Yes, please. Something easy this time. Oh, I'll try. Come mm -hmm. on. Yeah, this will be easy. I actually came to your books through your column in the Philadelphia Inquirer. Which Thank you. Read and laugh through every Sunday, but I just want to know if you ever found a pair of jeans that fit. <laughs> Do you guys read the column? You can read it online at my site if, if you don't get the Inquirer. But no. <laughs> if you're 53, they don't make jeans that fit. And if they do, they have a button fly. And I'm like, are you kidding? I'm a middle-aged woman. Do I look like the kind of, you know how many times a day I go to the bathroom? It's like, is that too much information? I started writing the column for the same reason I started writing the books. You know why, actually? Because I missed Irma Bombeck. Don't, can we hear it for Irma Bombeck? And I love the newspaper, because I love to read. And I was like, where is Irma, why can't, why is there no woman, Ellen Goodman, Anna Quinlan, wonderful writers, because I felt like the newspaper, well first off, the newspaper doesn't make the news, it's bad news, I need to laugh. I wanted something funny in the newspaper, and I also wanted more about family life. You know, that's why these books aren't legal thrillers, they're really stories about women, family, and relationships, and you see what it's about. And I said, so they were very nice to me at the Inquirer. They said, listen, how it came about was they said, we, we would like to excerpt your books in the Inquirer. I said, well, thank you. That's a real honor. But I would like to write a column for you. And because I think you need it. I know. When you get, you know what it's like when you get older. You, like, you start telling everybody. Like you spend the first 50 years being shy and the next 50 never shutting up, basically. And they said, well, we'd be happy to do it. And so the column is on my website if you want to read it, also on the Inquirer's web website. And it's just about everyday life, because to me, you know, it's like the hot water. There's bad times, but they pass. There's, to me, there's politicians, but you know, all that stuff doesn't matter as much to me as, as my daughter, as the people across the breakfast table, as my mother, as her health, as what it's like just to be ordinary, extraordinary women every day. And I said I wanted to write about that, so, and in a funny way, to make people laugh, to be something just to brighten their day. So thank you, I, I, I appreciate it. I think I'm doing the same thing in the column as in the books, although uh, I have to get to the point in the column, which is so hard for me. <laughs> Other questions? Yes, sir. Um, I've noticed in several of your books um, a common theme that there's a difference between law and justice. And Brilliant. It, it, <laughs> <laughs> and that, Sometimes they really are opposed to each other. True and I that. If you say anything more about that. Briefly, that's what I teach a little bit in that course in justice and fiction. Because if you remember Perry Mason, yes, yes, thank you. Yes. Okay, you tell that to twenty-year-olds. They're like, how many R's? But <laughs> Perry Mason, in the old days, law always led to justice. Perry Mason always represented an innocent guy, right? took the case to trial, got the innocent guy off, and the guilty guy happened to be in the back row and got him convicted. Every day, 25 minutes, worked like a charm. And I don't wanna go through the whole course, but the bottom line is, as time changed, as our culture changed, 
Vietnam, world went topsy-turvy. What started to happen is there was a, to me, at least when I looked at fiction, there was a disconnect between law and justice because in life there started to be a disconnect between law and justice. You can't have Watergate, you can't have an attorney general go to prison and a president resign for breaking the law and still have the good old days of law always leading to justice. And so a lot of the more recent modern fiction, law thwarts justice. And I start to like very much sort of living at that intersection. Because what I like about that is first it seems realistic to me. The more time I spend with the police, God bless them the job they do. But sometimes they're limited. They're limited by funds or they're limited by the law or they're limited, they're constrained. And in that blank space, people have to step in. You know, when you start to go back to the Scottolinis and why is there rules about how we live? I like to explore that. And so I like to explore, oh, we went, sat down. Um, in the absence of a conduct that is governed by law, how do we govern ourselves? How do we behave? And also works out good for these women because they're a little bit like Nancy Drew. They want to figure it out themselves. They're just normal people who are going to sleuth. So that's why, in a way, they're always fussing with police and alternately being helped by them. But you're right to have observed that, and I would give you an A+. Plus. <laughs> yes? When you're writing, how much time do you spend worrying about grammar and punctuation? Do you, do you leave that up to your editors? Or no. You, <laughs> um, you heard the question. I wor First off, I, I worry all the time about everything. <laughs> I wake up worried. Ask Mary, I, I was driving in today at a signing at noon. I, I'm in the parking lot at quarter of five because I don't want to be late for 5.30. I can't explain this to you. So, but the bottom line in terms of your question is everything like that I'm responsible for. You know, these days, and I have a wonderful editor in HarperCollins and I have a wonderful editor now, my new editor at St. Martin's, she's terrific. And what their job is to sort of say, I write the whole book a whole year, right? It takes me almost a year. I work seven days a week, all day, most of the night. You're right, I have no personal life. You can't have everything. So basically, after about six months, I know I have a book, because you remember I didn't have an outline, so now I have an ending. Then I get to spend three months trying to make everything better. And then I show it to my bosses, an agent and an editor. And they tell me what they think. Now generally, what they'll both do as an editorial function, is you interested in this? Yeah. Well, I'll tell it short. Is sort of say, you know what? You, 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 spend, you can spend a little more time on the family. Sometimes I go too fast because I don't want people to be bored. So they'll give me a very macro view. This is very strong. You give this part a little more punch. Make this person really evil. And look again, I have, two, oh, I have some real c conflict. And it's hard to really make conflict, but I say, just go there. Don't be afraid. And that's the kind of stuff my editor tells me. It isn't stuff like grammar. I'm supposed to do that. I know. <laughs> yes. My friend. All right. Uh, Joseph. Joseph, yes. Um, there's one thing that's very noticeable in your books. I, the first book I ever read by you was Lady Killer. Okay. And here's what I have noticed. I haven't read the other one, so I can't say this the same thing applies. But it's sort of apropos to the person who just presented the grammar situation. For the characters that you have, especially the women in this book, you have used no offensive language. Now, is there a reason for that? Yeah. I, and, yes. and, 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 and sort of apropos to what this other gentleman said about something about women and men, and I, I don't think that's true either. I think that you're right, that there's not as many women as women, men. But if a man wrote this book, I would have to think that every other word in some of the dialogue would be offensive to a lot of people. And that, I have to say, from a modern point of view, is kind of unique. Because even if you look at television or movies, or screenplays, whatever, there are some movies, uh, not that I'm offended by because I understand realism. Mm -hmm. However, you were able to pull off a situation with women who are very tough without using the language and yet it, making them very realistic. Well, thank you for that. Um, having heard such a lovely compliment, let me tell you the truth. <laughs> 
which is that I have changed. Anybody here read my first book, Everywhere That Mary Went? There's a little bit of profanity in that book. And well, look, I, realism is the key. The, I care so much, I, all the research is there, I, the police procedure, the characterization. We, you talked earlier about the dialogue. The dialogue, I want it to be real. I had a book, Rough Justice, there's a hired killer in it. To meet a hired killer, I went to prison. I met a guy, I spent an hour with a guy who killed two people. This isn't, if you've had a bad blind date, <laughs> and I've had those too, okay. It's like the worst blind date you ever had, right? Because the guy spends a lot of time kind of hitting on you, and the rest of the time, every other word is profane, and ugly profanity, and scary profanity. And I said, you know what? That's, well, of course, he's a hired killer. And the guy in Rough Justice talks tough. Because I wasn't gonna, I, I dialed it back a little bit. But I can't under, I can't be fake about that. Um, or I used more profanity earlier, Mary, because I had Mary, you know, I don't want to get into the psychology and tell you too much about her, but after her husband dies, she's angry. And the funny thing about Mary is that she curses in her head. So I guess what I'm saying is I did use, I use, I use profanity where it would be realistic. I try not to use it though, because I tell you this, I, I really do want to be read. And I'm not saying I want to be bought. I'm thrilled if you read me in a library. I want to connect to you. I want these images in the culture for our daughters, for ourselves, for men. Most of my readers are men. And because men aren't, are, you know, they're open-minded. They want to read about women just the same way as, I have a lot of men who write me and go, you know, I like to read your books so they teach me how women think. I don't know if I'm speaking for all of our gender. <laughs> if you have ovaries, I'm your representative, evidently. <laughs> but I guess what I'm saying is, I specifically watch it because I want people to recommend my book. And in the beginning, I had some profanity, and people, I, I get emailed to the site, which I answer. And a lot of it was so lovely and said, I love your books, but I don't want to give it to my mother. And I don't want to give it to my daughter. And I said, you know what? Watch it. So your, ab your observation is apt. I really do try to, sh and then certainly these women are tough, and there's lots of ways I can show their toughness without their being offensive. Thank you. Yes. Hi, I'm your vendetta defense lady. Oh, I thought uh, there I you go. I love Mary. I love her Italian family. Thank we you. We have a very large Italian American population here. I was real excited to see her come to the Poconos. When's she going to come to Scranton to visit her relatives? <laughs> <laughs> Mary should come to Scranton, but you don't have any bad guys in Scranton. Oh. <laughs> tried to map class and Google Bonnie Hart and you said you were going to explain it when we were talking. Bonnie Hart does not exist. I made it up. I went around the region. I didn't want to tell you the region because I'm very superstitious about this now. I'll tell you a quick story. You know, I told you I had five years of rejection. During that time, I wrote a novel that still was never published and the other novel that I wrote was the one that eventually was. Now, I didn't know it was going to be published. In fact, I thought it was not. So I said it there, and I said it. There's a part of South Philly that it's set in and it's set at Ninth and Wolf. Now Ninth and Wolf happens to be where my aunt had a luncheonette. She had a cheesesteak shop. And in the book, I put Ninth and Wolf, I put a church there. I just, I figured I'd be a shout out to my Aunt Rachel, right? Well, lo and behold, they published the book and I just sort of forgot about it. Then I get all this email. You think you know Philadelphia so well. <laughs> There's no church in Ninth and Wolf. We went there and a lady answered the door with no teeth. <laughs> That's my aunt. Back off. So ever since that, I have learned, and also I had one other book where, where I learned the lesson where I had a murder set on someone's street. And they were like, you know, we've all read the book. We're trying to sell our house. It's just a, it's, and you know, everybody's at heart a little superstitious. It's just a little jinxy. So now I just go in the region. What happened, happened to me, driving around the Poconos, 911 gets sent God knows where. And, but I made Bonnie Hart, which I thought was a very nice name for a town. I, I, don't you want to live in Bonnie Hart? But, uh, 
So it doesn't exist, but that's the reason why. I mean, the reason, the reason why is redundant. Go ahead. Um, last year, I did a lot of commuting, and I started to listen to books, which I had never done before. I've always loved to just read. Right. And I loved your voice. Um, most, a lot of times, books sound funny or the, stilted, but yours rang true. Um, it, I don't know, what is that about? Well, it's about not me, you know. <laughs> you know that, though. It's the reader. Right, yeah. Is, do you think it's the reader, then? Well, I don't read them. You know that. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I just want to take credit. I take credit for so many things that I don't do. I... Do, you, do you always have the same reader? I do. I ask for those readers. Okay. I think they're really good. Okay. I appreciate it. Well, I actually asked my publisher if I could read them myself, uh -huh. and they said, no. <laughs> and the tr they said, you have a Philadelphia accent. I said, I know. <laughs> what can I do? But the truth is, since I've listened to books as well, I usually I miss exits. Yes. You, right? <laughs> Did you do that too? Yes. I, I'm like, oh no. <laughs> or you're in the driveway waiting for, you know, and then you can't find where it ended. But uh, the people who do that are actresses, really. Uh -huh. And they do, I agree with you. They do like old man voices and yeah. accents and a lot of stuff that, like, I'm a ham. I'm not an actress. Uh -huh. So I'm glad you enjoy them. Audiobooks are great. Uh -huh. You know, the, the visually impaired, they're a godsend. And for lots of people with big, long commutes. Um, so I appreciate you doing that, and uh, I, I was really very honored that I could have the readers that I do have. Well, thank you. I really made my trip very enjoyable, and I laughed a lot. Good. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Any other questions? Are we okay on time? Should we take one last one? Does anybody have a last question? Come on, you know you do. Here's my girl. Hi. This might be one that you get frequently. That's but, okay. Um, was it difficult to learn the, pol the police procedure and all, all that type of thing? Spending time with the police and finding out how they work and how that dovetails with the, the justice system and working that into the books? Do you know that in 15 years and 15 books, no one has ever asked me that question? What <laughs> <laughs> a good question. Um, no, it's not difficult, because here's what I love about people, among the millions of things I love about people. Because the first books and the stuff I wrote that was unpublished, like it isn't just because I'm published now. I would go to, I've gone to local police, I've gone, I remember going to the Philadelphia police. Now, I, I bring a pad and a Dunkin' Donuts. <laughs> I'm sorry, cops really do like Dunkin' Donuts. Who doesn't like Dunkin' Donuts? And um, I just, I just beg my way in, and I did from the beginning. And because really the question is, what is it like to be you? How do you do your job? And I feel a little bit like sometimes we don't get asked that enough. Like, no one does. Don't you just want to tell somebody about your day? Well, I found that that's all they wanted to do. And I would, more importantly what, than what they told me was the language they use, what they said, their slang. And I found from the beginning that I was, you know, Go, I mean, I do all the research myself. It's totally fun. I learn stuff. But I have, it's the most enjoyable part. There's some weird things I've had to do. The one thing, one of the books, um, Benny Rosado has to drive up the art museum steps in Philadelphia. Because I figured Rocky ran up them, but if you're a girl, you're, you're going to drive. So I, at the time, I had a Ford Expedition, right? So here, this is what I do. It's night, I wait till like 1230 at night. It's pretty quiet. I, at that point, I was published, so I put a bunch of paperbacks in the back seat in case I have to bribe somebody. Like, look, you know, I'm not crazy. Well, I am, but I'm published crazy. And uh, so I drive around that big oval in front of the Art Museum. I have a Ford Expedition, which is four-wheel drive. And I get ready. I get ready. I go, bam, boom. I start to drive right up the steps. And it's going, <laughs> I mean, I, I put it all in the books because my, my teeth were like, you know, like rattling in my head. And I get halfway up, and I'm a little afraid of heights. And then I realize, I have to get down. You know, like I just didn't think. I mean, I could have gone all the way up, but it was really getting a little scary. And I thought, I get the idea. But then I have to reverse. I'm the worst reverser in the world. Like, you guys aren't safe if I'm reversing. You should, I'll leave last, and you should all go. And so I basically had to reverse, you know, all the way back down. But I got out. I mean, I, research is fun. Talking to people is fun. And if you write, and you're like me, where I'm kind of a people person, 
but in my house 24 seven, I only come out and tour. I'm happy to just meet somebody, you know. <laughs> hey, hi, want to talk about anything? I'll take notes on it. So it's, it's a great joy. It's, it's the joy of meeting people and having them talk about themselves. So thank, thank you, you for your excellent more. question. Thank you. I have one more question. For okay. You. Do you still use your library card? Of course I do. Of course I do. Chester <laughs> County Library System. Okay. Yes? Well, listen, you guys, thank you very, very much. I, this has really been just a wonderful night. Thank you. If you, got, if you took any pictures, send them to me because I didn't get to take pictures and I wanted to. So send them to me at the website. You'll see it's scottalini.com. LisaScottalini.com. Really send her pictures. She likes to see them and, and think about reading and look again with your, with your book club. She really does. Yes, I want you to come to my house. To her home. <laughs> Lisa has a wonderful treat for anybody who stays and uh, gets an autograph. So please join us in the ballroom in a few minutes. We have refreshments there for you too. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.